Okay, we're going to get started. So thanks for being patient with us. Hopefully we'll have some people coming in. Uh, there was a little accident apparently. So we want to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name's Bob Lease, and I'm over at uh, Buffalo Grove High School. And um, I'm part of a coalition in our community called the Link Together Coalition, up on the, on, the, on the slide here. The Link Together Coalition was formed with a number of people from our community to take a look at doing preventative works, uh, work within the community to help kids and families. Um, talking to their kids about drugs, uh, specifically marijuana and alcohol, because that's what our surveys have told us are the main drugs of choice of children that we've given the Illinois Youth Survey to in our district. So we're doing everything possible in the schools, and you can see there are a number of high schools in District 214 involved. There are junior highs, there's community, there's religious organizations, there's police departments, there's park districts. So there's many different people who have come together to link together to bring you information. And in association with our friends over at Omni Youth Services, they have people over there who've written grants for us to get federal and state money to do this kind of preventative work. And fortunately, we've been able to receive over a million dollars worth of grant funding. So because of that money, we're doing things within the community. And one of the things is we got very fortunate and we were able to contact John Underwood and have him come out tonight to talk to us. So before John starts to talk to us, I'd just like some of our coalition members, um, the Link Together members, stand up just so that you can see who they are. So if you have any questions at the end of the night, feel free. They've got little th name tags on them. <laughs> I need to tell you that these people volunteer a lot of time and energy for the good of your children and for the good of our community. So we're, we're very thankful to have them involved with us in District 214. So here we go. I talked to John when I first came in, and I had uh, about probably five pages worth of notes with all of his accolades and his uh, Vita. And he said, Bob, don't, don't use all that stuff. He says, uh, just introduce me because I'm going to tell him all about myself and my specialty. So I, I do want to thank John for coming out tonight. Um, he will give you some information that I think will uh, feed your minds and feed your souls to do some deep thinking, not only for those of you who are athletes, for perhaps for some of us who are not, about finding our peak performance and living a healthy lifestyle. So without further ado, thank you, John Andrew. Thank you. Thanks. And, uh, thanks. And I always, uh, I always start out by saying my all my opinions are absolutely free of charge. That comes with comes with my regular routine. Um, had an awful busy year and. Uh, Travel so much, and I have uh, in the last couple of weeks just had was inundated with uh, with requests for programs from really high level populations. I went down, did the Miami Heat, and um, talked to all the players that are left from their on their new team and the old players that were there from before. But um, you know, it's it's when you're working with high level populations, um, it's it's different. Uh, I'll tell you right off the top than working with the potpourri of mankind because I mean those are very Talented people, number one. Secondly, they're very highly motivated for the most part. But that doesn't exclude them from having issues with their lifestyles, um, almost to the contrary. Uh, I've seen some pretty amazingly successful people in lots of walks of life that uh, uh, had some serious glitches with the way they're living their lives. And it almost makes you wonder how they're as successful as, as they can be um, when, they're, when they're living their life that way. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you some background just on how this thing got going. Um, uh, I spent 20 years with Olympic sport. I was a, a, not only a coach, but a, a physiologist, a scientist. And I did tests on athletes. You know, we'd go in a laboratory and, or even while they're doing their training. And every test uh, or every capacity an athlete could have, strength, power, speed, endurance, jumping ability, all those different things, um, off the line speed, acceleration speed, speed over time, speed endurance power over time, power endurance, plyo endurance, the ability to jump over and over and over and reach near your maximum height levels in jumping, all those things I studied. And um, <clears throat> so it was a, a real education, but what I was studying was heart, lungs, and muscles, and blood, blood chemistry, and all those ventilation values, like how much oxygen goes in your body, how much carbon dioxide comes out. It was a lot to think about, but I, I would trade that all in right, uh, right now all those years I spent doing that 
um, if I had just started my career um, studying the brain and central nervous system. Because um, by far that has way more to do with performance than what we always thought, which was that your muscles are the most important thing. And uh, so I can show you the, some of the things from that perspective, but uh, 20 years with Olympic sport, now 15 years ago, I left. And um, it was sort of a really a baptism by fire. I took uh, three years off. I was going to take a year off. To, I knew nothing about prevention. And I'm talking pot and alcohol, drug prevention. Uh, I, I had a, a fantastic mother and father. Um, grew up in a sport family. My dad was an athletic director and a football coach. And uh, none of us ever played for him because we were all little guys. But I can tell you this. Um, I learned more from my father than I learned from anybody in my whole life. I'm proud to say it. And um, so I was lucky to have a good home life, um, a good example set, um, parents who helped us find something we were good at and encouraged us to do those things and, and stay focused and all that stuff that you need to do when you're a young person. And um, um, I had good coaches. I had great coaches that demanded a lot but also um, expected a lot and also at the same time I wanted to impact my young life. And I, and I think that's something also that um, is huge. And I had great teachers. And it came from a town that really had uh, amazing opportunities for kids. And so uh, that was a good start to my life. And I had great coaches after that, too. Um, after being um, an athlete, and I was a, an All-American athlete, uh, I was a distance runner. Um, I then uh, went out to Oregon and ran for Bowerman, the guy that started Nike, legendary coach. and. Uh, I ended my career running for New York Athletic Club and then uh, uh, didn't want to leave sports. It was the best part of my life, so I became a, a, a scientist and a coach. And um, after that, uh, 15 years of um, um, working on this human performance project. But what really set me up to do that project was that I took that year off, which turned into three years, uh, and, and was a preventionist. Uh, I was in schools teaching prevention ed about pot and drugs and alcohol to kids, tobacco, nicotine, all that stuff. And um, after doing that gig as a prevention educator, I was like, you know what, people really need to wake up and think about how using these negative substances ruins everything you set out to do. So uh, I connected the dots, and, and that's where it's gone. So the Human Performance Project was, was started 15 years ago. Before that, we were known as the American Athletic Institute, uh, both my organizations. Um, but I dropped it and went to Human Performance Project because what I realized is this isn't just for athletes. This is for human beings. Uh, anybody can benefit from this information. Parents, coaches, teachers, kids, anybody. Because if you really think about it, and you will tonight, um, we don't have an optimal lifestyle in this country. And, and I would almost say, even if you have an awesome lifestyle, there's probably, once in a while, things that compromise it. So I'll show you some of those things. A lot of it's about the brain and central nervous system. And the phrase that we coined, which is called Central nervous system readiness is what I've studied now for 15 years. And, um, you know, your brain's either ready to support high-level mental and physical work or it's not. And people don't have a clue how you would prepare your brain to function at a high level for a test, a musical, uh, you know, audition, uh, a, 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 an exam, uh, uh, you know, a dance, recital, a music, any, anything to do with music, art. Uh, when people are at their best, I mean, you have so much greater potential, or athletics. So this is for everybody, not just for athletes. I studied in Europe at the Finnish Sport Institute. Uh, I was there for three years. I really got my background in human performance studies. Uh, came back and ended up in Lake Placid. And uh, you know, most of you guys know that's that famous for the miracle hockey game, 1980. But uh, it's, re it's a really cool town. It's a, it's a beautiful place, but it's also got a lot of folklore, mostly around the sports. And, you know, for a town of 2,500 people to host the Olympics twice is by itself a pretty amazing thing. But great place to train athletes. I worked there in human performance studies and coaching at the Olympic Training Center, doing tests on athletes and coaching athletes. And uh, I did about 14,000 of those tests over 20 years. And that's a pretty good background on learning how the body works. Um, I also coached the whole time. I had 28 Olympic athletes, and I actually coached five medalists. And... Uh, so I, I took it seriously, but we got some, made some great things happen. Um, this program has now been used by, we're approaching 700 colleges. Uh, I'm going, my next gig is actually Georgia Tech, and uh, it's actually my second trip down there this year, and, uh, 
And now the next day I found out that I have to go to Baylor to talk just to their basketball team. And uh, they have a pretty phenomenal women's basketball team. So uh, working with the SEAL project, um, literally the icing on my cake, nothing will top it in my career. Uh, to get to be around those people even for 24 hours, um, most of you would just be shaking your head saying, wow, where these guys come from. That's, how, that's what I thought. I thought I'd seen some pretty tough athletes in my time. And um, I got down there and, you know, you want to see what serious is. Um, I think that it's, a, it's like about 10 shelves up from, from uh, where any serious athlete is. These guys are, are something else. And uh, we have a laboratory. That's actually the only picture that exists of that lab in Virginia. And we do tests on these guys. Just like you do tests on athletes for all the capacities they have to have for the things they do. And uh, the extremes that these guys go through just to become a SEAL, um, really, uh, the average person, you can watch a show about it. Um, you have no idea these guys. They don't, a lot of them just don't have breaking points all, all the way to the, the end of the line, if you know what I mean. If, if you look at these guys up here, you think, what are these guys doing? They're trying to get warm because they hypothermiate you to try to get you to quit, you know, which they try to lower your core temperature so you just say, I can't do this, and you give up. And um, they're just amazing human beings, and they're, they're in a whole different circuitry than, than most humans. Um, I said this tonight to somebody in here. I said, um, We've done studies on those guys to extremes beyond what human beings are capable of handling mentally, physically, emotionally. And uh, I can say that we knew of this before even doing those studies. Uh, no one performs better under stress. No one, not even Navy SEALs. Um, some people just perform better than others and these guys perform the best of anybody. And that's not a stretch. Because we've done studies now and found even enzymes, neuropeptides in their brains that they have like 30% more of than normal people. So. so they're tough guys. That's just part of it. But they're not just tough physically. They're tough mentally, emotionally, spiritually even. And um, I got credited in a Sports Illustrated article with being the person that they put in charge of changing the way we train the SEALs. And that's been going on now, this project, for eight years. And uh, I'm really proud of it. I, um, I, I can tell you this. This is my other regret that I didn't get in this project early and spend my whole life down there in Virginia. So the most significant experiences I've had with anybody, athletes or anybody, um, has been with SEALs, not, not with athletes. And uh, the methods that they use to train these guys um, are just head and heels above anything we're using uh, with athletes. So I guess it's because if failure is not an option, it puts you in a whole different frame of mind for wanting to be a little more serious about it and motivated for it and, uh, and successful in what your outcomes are. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, what can this program do? It, it, it isn't about a presentation. Okay, tonight we're having a presentation. It's about a program that's free, and I'm not, I'm not, that's not a stretch. We give you the materials to run this program in your schools so that your kids understand how to be more successful by the way they're living their lives. Studies on sleep, studies on sleep, studies on diet, nutrition, studies on how to deal with stress, studies on the negative topics that people don't like to talk about. You know why prevention people don't go in and just start talking about pot and alcohol or even showing you that 45% of your seniors drink and th almost 30% of them smoke dope right here? I saw the data. It's in the booklet tonight. Read it. All right? That's not any different than any place else in this country. You know why you don't start just talking about that? Because people don't want to talk about it. It's negative. The, the fire doors come down. So we talk about lifestyle, because that's a lifestyle glitch. And then maybe somebody will say, hey, you know what? I, I care about this thing over here. I really care about it. And I know this isn't good for me, but I'll somehow justify it. Lack of sleep, crappy foods, pot, alcohol, too much stress, too many things going on in your life. So when you narrow down these things and start to deal with some of the negatives, maybe it's easier to deal with by talking about the whole context of the way you're living your life. Because even as adults, sometimes we need that reality check. So it can help you academically, athletically, act activities-wise, music, art, dance, anything you care about or, or are good at, that you're putting time, effort, and energy into. And even socially, think about how people that have these problems, how it affects their ability to function with human, human beings socially. It creates all kinds of problems. So, so I'll, I'll start out tonight by just giving you guys a slant on time. Um, 
everybody's probably heard this, little things make big things happen. I mean, I remember coaches telling us that when we were young athletes. And, you know, little things that you take for granted can make huge things happen. Um, mostly, that, that's a statement about time. Um, you know, I, I think a guy from Russia, he was the father of Russian sport. His name was Matviev. And um, he, he made this statement. He said, the single largest factor in athletic development is time. Or any development, it's time, right? The more time you put in, the better you get at something. Um, but eventually, you run out of time. And I can tell you one venue where you run out of time really quick, and that's being an athlete. Your best years come, your best years go, it's over. Uh, clearly, by the, your late 30s, if you stayed in it that long, uh, you know, hormonally, you, you don't recover as fast. Um, what do you think I was discussing down there with the heat? You know, I mean, they, some of their best players are now five or six of them are in their, you know, heading for their mid 30s. You, you just can't keep doing it the way you were doing it when you were at your best. So, how do you get a few more years at that age? All right. So, think of four years of high school. That's, that's the thing I've used for Olympic athletes. Four years is 1,460 days or 35,040 hours, or you can break it down if you want to minutes. Uh, eventually, you run out of time. The day comes that you wanted something amazing to happen, and it, it's either going to happen or it's not. And um, at that point in time, you start to realize that every day mattered and every day counted because now it's behind you. And that's the same for everybody, whether it's your ACTs or uh, your final exams or the letter that you got, and here's the day, and you didn't get in the school you wanted to get in, or you tried out for something and didn't make it, or you did. Um, you run out of time. So here's some more things about time. This is the Olympic final. You know, Bolt's pretty unbeatable even still, even with his glitches, with his injuries and stuff. But look, first to last, that much time. That's not a lot of time from 10th place or 8th place to, uh, to first. Or a 30K ski race, you know, 18.6 miles uphill, downhill. Uh, it's a brutal sport. I actually coach some athletes in this sport. The highest endurance capacity of any athlete. Go 30 kilometers and 18.6 miles through all that and lose by a, a, a foot, you know. Um, the men's downhill, two Olympics ago, um, first to 10th place, 57 hundredths of a second. And no one cares who got 10th, right? When we watch TV, they're not going to have a, a whole thing about, well, here's a guy in 10th, here's all about his life, right? You're going to see some stuff about the guys that win and get silver and bronze. And uh, look at the separation. Seven hundredths, two hundredths. Look at the end here. Um, two hundredths, three hundredths, one one hundredth of a second. I mean, you know, being 10th in the Olympics is nothing to be ashamed of. That's amazing. Um, but I'm saying time is really small. Or Michael Phelps' uh, medal that he got by literally the, a fingernail. You know, and th this is one of those eight medals that would have you know, been seven, seven golds and a silver wouldn't have been the same as eight golds because Spitz had won seven golds in 1972. So, I mean, it's a, they say it's one of the most famous pictures ever taken about sport. And uh, so small things make big things happen. Um, we did an analysis of sport and found that um, every time you go to do your performance in sports, you don't have your best performance, all right? We know that. You don't go out tonight and score 30 points in basketball and tomorrow 32 and the next day 34 and the next game 36. It doesn't go like that. If it did, you could get, go down and work, play for the heat. So here's how it goes. Um, we analyze sports where performance is performance. So I'll give you an example. Running, throwing, jumping, swimming. Sports where you know your best time as soon as you cross the finish line. Oh, my God, I was way off today. Or, oh, my gosh, I just ran faster than I've ever run in my life. All right? So that's a definitive. So we looked at sports like that. We analyzed results for a whole season. And we threw out any results that were, like, for instance, bad weather, stuff like that. And we ended up finding that there was a range of performances at about 82 to 87% that was their average performance. We didn't want to put it at one number because there were too many in this range. So if you prepare optimally to play uh, uh, your sport and you go out there, I think that you can have a performance anytime you want between 82 and 100%. And I'm going to say this, the 100% games are going to happen five, ten times in your whole career, even if you stay in it a long time. I ran, when I was a runner, I ran actually a 1,000 races. A 1,000. That's a long career. And that's a lot of races, believe me. And I think I probably, if I thought about it long enough, I could remember them all. And I can say this, there was five races that I remember that were just, I couldn't have went any faster, couldn't have ran another step. And I remember those five races out of a 1,000. I can tell you right now where they were and who they were against and who probably finished behind me. 
Here's, here's a football team. So this is a little different for you guys in team sports. So think about this. And this is a stretch, but just hear me out. What if a team at the worst was out there 82 to 87% because they totally prepare to be out there at their best? But instead, you got a guy having a 91% game, and he scores four touchdowns and runs for 250 yards and, or catches, you know, you know, uh, you know, 10 passes in the game and, and, and has some amazing performance. And then you got somebody else on your team that has a 55% game. And you're out there with 10 other people. Well, this is how you win games or lose games, especially in team sports. What if everybody cared enough about what you're doing that everybody was out there at their best? You'd win more games. There's no question about it. A 500 team would be a 750 team, and you'd be going to state playoffs, right? Or a 750 team would be a 1,000% team and, 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 and maybe win a state championship. This is the things where you have to start to think about being successful. And then if you're with other people, especially in a team situation, who's letting you down and who's not? And this gets talked a lot about in the, in the Naval Special Warfare and the SEALs. Because you don't want to be out there with people who let you down, believe me. So, the choices you make determine lots of things. We have about um, 3,000 posters. You can have them. We don't sell anything. Um, I'm not selling the booklets tonight, believe me. Um, I, I give everything we've done research-wise, everything we've published, all our materials, I give them away. I've been doing it for 15 years. So we have 4,000 posters. Get them. Get them up on the walls. Get them to your teams. Ask the teams and say, okay, which ones of these float your boat? And you'll find that some of the kids really like And Don't use pictures that are on the posters. Use your kids in the pictures to create role models. Those are important things too. So here's some advice right off the top from a coach. And I was a coach a long time. I'm not anymore. It isn't just what you're willing to give to be successful. It's what you're willing to give up. What sacrifices do you want to make, especially you athletes here tonight, what sacrifices do you want to make to ever see your full potential as an individual or as a team or as a businessman or woman or as a teacher or as a coach or any other walk of life that's sitting in here tonight? Because you've got to give something up. And one of the best lessons I could teach you athletes here tonight is this, that if you want to be a good athlete, find out tonight that you have to live your life different than other people not the same as other people. Because it doesn't have much to do with talent as it has to do with living a good life. So I had a coach, his name was Bill Bowerman. It was the guy that started Nike. He used to trace our feet and make running shoes because back then running shoes were just lame. They were terrible. And uh, the surface, you know, the, the midsoles were really hard and they didn't absorb any shock. And he's the guy that invented the waffle. You know, it looked like he actually burned up Barbara's waffle iron making waffle soles and he glued them on the bottom of shoes and he made the first running shoes that had little nubbies on the bottom of them to absorb the shock. Smart guy. And uh, he made a quote once and I never found this out until after I was coached by him. He's no longer alive. He said, as far as talent goes, all that you, everything that you need is already inside you. That's a pretty good quote. Because I'm going to say this right now. Every single person in here has some amazing talent. The hard part is finding them and developing them. Just like all kids have something they could be good at. And that's our job as teachers or coaches or people who sign up to be with kids, especially a parent, is to help your kid find something they're good at. Maybe even something they can turn into making a living or a life out of. Those are assets that you have. All right, so think about that. So where do talents come from? Well, that's been pretty much figured out now. We can look at the Human Genome Project. Really interesting stuff. I mean, the National Geo tape that's out on this, there's a, there's a school lesson, right? I know we have school people here. Make the whole school watch the Human Genome Project. Wow, what a perspective on how we're all different, but we're all the same, and where you get all these amazing things from. So if you want, you can even figure out which parent gave you those from their lineage, gave you those talents and abilities. You know, we found out about 8% of kids have physical attributes that would predispose you to be a, maybe an elite athlete or a Navy SEAL or play for the heat. I don't know. Think about it. Eight out of a hundred people are talented physically. What's that mean? They might have the uh, amazing body type. You know, I mean, every time I'm at the Olympic Training Center and the volleyball teams are there, I feel so small, you know, or, or with the heat, you know, you just, you're like looking up at people. So, um, you know, your body type, your heart and lung size, your muscle fiber type, 
You know, you got a whole bunch of fast switch fibers, man. You can do explosive work for real short periods of time. You can be fast, you can jump, you can have incredible power outputs. That's genetic, you're born with that. So if I go to a school and I say, hey, how's your sports? And they go like, well, you know, we just, we don't have a lot of talented kids. I just start laughing because I say, okay, well, give me, give me 100 kids. We probably have 100 people sitting here, all right? And I know that out of 100 people, if I'm looking at young people, that there's at least eight. And then you're going to have those amazing years where there's a group of kids that comes through, and it isn't eight. It's like 25 or 30. That happens. And that's when your school will have some championships and some awesome teams. The unfortunate part is that sometimes you'll be wondering where the eight are, all right? So it has something to do with talent. But that's a gift. And don't you think there's a percent in the human population from music and art and all those things? Because not everybody can do it. Not everybody can be an elite athlete, has physical attributes that would ever be able to be used for that. There's some people who are really good in math and some people aren't, right? I was one of the ones that wasn't, all right? So you think about all those talents. And then you've got to be patient. You know, there's no shortcuts to any place worth going. I mean, that's a great quote. And I'm a quote person. I think about the problems we have in an impatient society, right? And how we take everything to that extreme now. Or how about this, the, the quickest way to the top with the least amount of investment or effort, right? And I see a lot of parents and adults going, yep, that's where we are. And how, how easy kids will quit stuff nowadays for you kids here tonight rather than work at it to get better at it, to get better at it, to be, get better at it. And maybe that was your talent. But you're never going to find out when you just give up so think about it. It's been written about it. I, I always ask, how many people have read this book? Let's have a census. Okay. Here's a good book from Coach Underwood's book club. Hey, I'm not selling this either, but he is. Daniel Coyle, he's a good writer. He's written a lot of great books. The Talent Code, Unlocking the Secrets of Skill in Sports, Art, Music, Math, or Just About Anything. That's the subtitle. And you know what the book's about? It's about in all walks of life, if you follow... The talent code, which is in this book, you'll be successful. You'll find a way to take something you could be good at and turn it into something you're good at. But guess what you can't leave out? 10 years or 10,000 hours of work. And he says it'll stand up in any venue that you reach elite level over time. 5,000 hours gets you to mediocrity. Another 5,000 hours gets you to strong capability. And then you start to see that, oh my God, I could be good at this. Think about that statement. So this is like a pyramid. If you, this is a chart actually written on this topic. If you spend one hour a day doing something, you could maximize your talent in 27.4 years. Well, if you're an athlete, <laughs> your best years will for sure be over. All right. Um, if you spend four hours a day, you can get there in 6.8 years. You think this isn't true? I've seen it. In, have you ever watched women's gymnastics on TV? Little tiny girls. 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, the things that they can do. If you didn't watch it, we just won the world championships again. Go Team USA. All right, it's been a while since we've been at the top. It goes up and down sometimes. I mean, that's just amazing what they can do at that age. So, so it's called the 10K Hours Rule by our account. There's another one of our posters. You become what you practice. You don't want to put in the time, effort, and energy. It doesn't matter that you have talent because every adult in this room can tell every kid in this room Dozens of stories of amazingly talented people who had amazing abilities that didn't want to put in the time, effort, and energy. Or got caught up in things that ruined it, and they ended up throwing it away, giving it away, wasting their ticket. So think about it. you got to put in the time, effort, and energy. And there's another part to it. You might not be the most talented, but you might want to work harder than somebody else, and you can actually come out to a higher level. I actually had uh, 28 athletes I coached. I told you that made the Olympic team. That's a pretty, pretty lofty goal. I never made one. I ran world championships twice. But I, you think about this. Um, out of those 28 athletes, one day I took two pieces of paper based on this slide. And I put it on paper. It came out 15 hard workers, 13 talents. They made an Olympic team because they wanted it more than somebody who was more talented. You think it's any different in the working world? or getting in the school that you want to get in or anything else. You might 
have to work harder to get it. So Matt Vieve's other saying, and it's probably the saying that floats my boat as an athlete and always will. I think it's the best sports statement, statement ever. Remember when you're not training somewhere, someone is training. When you meet them, they will beat you. The Russians always have a way of saying it, just sort of directly. And uh, otherwise, you go to the gulag. And uh, so uh, Matt Vieve said this, and uh, he was the father of Russian sport. But this is when Russia dominated sports from the 40s, 50s, all, all the way to 1980. That hockey game was actually the beginning of the downfall of the whole Soviet sports system. But, you know, you got to work. And uh, the single biggest event in the human body in 24 hours for any of us in this room happens at night when you're sleeping. It's not the workouts. That's important. Yes, you have to have proper training methods and periodization of your training and hard, easy, and medium days. Um, Growth happens at night, new muscle mass is formed at night, training effect really goes in the bank, the money goes in the bank at night, all muscle repair happens at night. Check this out. If you went to bed at 10 o'clock at night, any of you athletes in here, because my career is over, all right, about an hour and a half to two hours after you fall asleep, you get a huge release of human growth hormone, and that's when all this stuff in human muscle and the effect of training in human muscle happens. It's called early sleep. Not much happens between midnight and about 2 o'clock in the morning, and then from 2 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the morning, all your mental and psychological repair happens, all your neurological repair happens. All the stuff you learned in school during the day that you need to remember so that you can ace the next test that's coming goes from short-term memory to long-term memory between 2 and 6 in the morning. Wow, is that important for schools? You better believe it. So what if you don't sleep enough? I don't know. Check this out. Here's the amount of human growth hormone release doing a morning workout. Here's the amount of human growth hormone release when you do an afternoon workout, like you guys do every day from 3 to 5 o'clock. An hour and a half to two hours after you fall asleep, this is the amount of human growth hormone you kids release. That's when babies grow double in size the first month, month and a half, two months, right? They weigh 6 to 8 pounds. All of a sudden they weigh 15, 20 so all you kids, and I see young athletes here tonight, if you want to grow, if you want to get bigger, and first your bones will grow, and then you'll start putting on muscle. The more you sleep, the more you grow. How's, there for, how's that for a research study? Because the single biggest event in a human body in 24 hours physiologically is early sleep when you get this huge release of HGH. And after you go through the growth spurt, then you start putting on muscle mass. So all you athletes that are older athletes, like you guys up here that want to get bigger, and put on the mask so you can be better in sports, all right? If you don't sleep, it's, it's all lost. There goes all your training effect because you'll never have the muscle mass to increase your capacities. All mass gains happen. That means you have to have a set time for when you go to sleep at night. So if I go to sleep, if I go to sleep tonight and I go to bed at um, uh, my normal sleep time is 10 o'clock. This happens 11.30 to 12. Next night I go to bed at 2 in the morning. It doesn't like move around for you because of your crappy lifestyle. You just lose all that training effect. So all the great workout you did today, that's, that's awesome. There's the stimulus for this to happen. At night, you don't get the HGH release. It doesn't happen. So this is for a human being. This is how kids grow. This is how humans grow. This is when you repair all the damage to your muscles. And as you get older and you don't have the hormonal system to repair muscle mass for you adults here that work out, it's even more important at that point in your time because HGH is the single biggest factor in muscle repair or muscle maintenance, maintaining your muscle mass. That's why you see as you reach your later years, my dad's 90 now, he used to be this great big strong beastly man, and now he's skinny and little and you know, your muscle mass doesn't replace itself. This is a slide I just was down to Georgia Tech and this is morning workout, afternoon workout, this is actual research slide, here's the HGH release. And HGH only goes one direction your whole life, down and down and down, from the time you're born to the time you're 90. It decreases and decreases and decreases and decreases. But it's at its peak levels right about from where you guys are now till about age 23. So anyway, that's the story on HGH. Another thing is this brain science stuff. I told you if I could go back and change, I know now that heart, lungs, and muscles aren't the most important factor in athletic performance. It's the brain and central nervous system. It is the single biggest factor in performance. If you want to perform well as an athlete, you have to have a very highly rested brain. All the signals for everything you're going to do is coming from here to all these other areas. All right, so think about that. Another thing is we could have a more positive outlook on our futures. You know, I mean, when you look at like the negativism 
of human beings, and this comes from sports psychology, and I threw it in because I want you to understand this. Probably every athlete has made this statement at some point in his career about a team or an individual event, depending on what kind of athlete you are. Oh, my God, we're going to get killed today. You bet you are. It's probably going to be worse than you think. Because your outlook alone ruins the possibilities for you to be successful. Look at some of these negative comments. Most of these things have happened. Um, but negative thoughts, they say for every positive thought, humans have 16 negative thoughts. And we all probably know somebody that has 50 or 100. Um, what was that thing they had on Saturday Night Live? What was it? The, some, was it Debbie or something? Some lady? <laughs> Debbie Dowder, right. Just all negative all the time, right? Um, this is brain scans before competing. Do you think you're going to lose? Do you think you're going to win? All right, so not much brain activity going on if you have a negative outlook. If you have a positive outlook, hey, come on, we can beat these guys. You know, come on, let's, I'm taking this guy out, all right? Just your train of thought. Uh, how about this? You know, um, I'm going to flunk this test, all right? Oh, okay, you're, you're helping yourself do it. That's good. Or uh, she'll never go out with me, right? Everything. Look at every aspect of your life. He's got his team picked. I'm not even going to try out. I, I hear this stuff all the time. My, 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 my brother's a, a coach in New York State. He had a bunch of seniors. That, you know, they, he coaches alpine skiing in the winter. And uh, I wouldn't be telling this story in, story in Florida. But anyway, um, these kids were seniors, had the first ski off, and only five kids can race varsity. So all young athletes beat all the seniors. So they come in on Monday and turn in their stuff. We quit. My brother's going, like, you quit? What do you mean you quit? Well, if we're not going to ski varsity, we're not going to do this. You know, we quit. And my brother's, oh, so you're going to let a, a freshman and a sophomore take your position? You're a senior? Okay, give me the stuff. Quit. So um, this is a, my, my series of slides I found. I just wanted to see this. The first year that women's weightlifting was actually in the Olympics was in Beijing. It's now an official lifetime sport until they get rid of it like they tried with wrestling. So here's how it goes. Um, this girl was, just before the Olympics, broke the world record, lifted more than any woman's ever lifted, was number one going into the Olympics and broke the world record two weeks before the Olympics. So she's ranked number one, she's lifted more than anyone's ever lifted, and she's got a chance for a gold medal. And this is with one lift left and three other women have broken her world record. So if you look at her face, you know, with, with the exception of having a box of Kleenex in front of her, she doesn't look like she's real confident, and not only have they broken her record, it's been broken by, uh, I think, about 16 pounds, which is almost insurmountable. Um, so anyway, it's her last lift, and she actually lifts a new world record. So she surprises herself, and look at her face. Total disbelief, right? She can't even believe that she, you know, she's basically going, I, I'm going to get fourth, no medal. And you guys probably know that they don't give out any tin or aluminum medals. And, uh, so, so anyway, she ended up on the last lift, a Chinese woman broke that world record, so she ended up getting second, and she looks pretty happy, but I'm just saying, talk yourselves into things, not out of things. I mean, I look at young people today, how many of them have this, like, doubt times 10 compared to when we were kids? I, I don't look at statistics and go, like, okay, well, I know I can't beat him, and I can't beat him, you know, I'm going to go, shoot the gun off, let's go here. Have a brighter outlook for your futures, and we need to know that you have it, and we also need to support it as adults for kids if we want to bring out the best in you. We also know the brain gets worn out and runs out of energy. It, it needs to recharge. Just like a car has a battery, your brain needs to have time to recharge, and we've looked at some of these things. If your brain runs your body, which it clearly does, readiness to train and compete is dependent upon your brain being very rested. Um, huge studies were done at Stanford University. And the lady that did the study, you can look at It's very simple to look them up. Uh, her name is Sherry Ma, M-A-H. Very simple three-letter word for a name. And she's the world's expert now with sport and sleep studies. And they have an amazing sleep studies research uh, department at Stanford University. Um, and and I, I will say that Stanford is the number one sports school in the NCAA overall every year with results of all sports merged, purged together. Um, anyway, Sherry did a study and proved that um, the brain seems to build up energy reserves or deficits over one to three days and will function at that level. Well, you know what that means? That means that if you have a game on a Saturday for you high schoolers that are here who care, you usually have certain sports where, you know, like football where every weekend you're going to have a game on Friday or Saturday or a big invitational cross-country meet or a wrestling tournament or whatever. Saturday is usually a pretty important day. 
that if you want to perform well, you have to rest, start resting your brain on Wednesday. What happens Friday night has very little to do with what's going to happen the next day on Saturday. Um, I think of sports with higher skill levels. And I think of how important this is times 10 compared to a, a sport where, you know, like for instance running, where your skill is really based on efficiency. So think about that. You have to rest up your brain far longer than you have to rest up your body. We also know what drains the brain's energy levels. Um, when we look at our lifestyle nowadays with minimal sleep and Facebook and all our electronic gadgetry that takes time and minimal sleep and pot and alcohol and crappy foods and nutrition and TV time still. Um, pretty amazing that there's as much TV watched as, it, as, as there is. Now we've just added Facebook and texting and all that other stuff to it. Um, so anyway, uh, they say about 100,000 chemical reactions per second during athletic competition in the brain. That's the chemical part of the brain. Um, we've started to measure for the first time neural fatigue. If we use our brain too much, even for thinking stuff, can we tire the brain out so that it affects us physically? I'll give you an example. Anyone who's ever pulled an all-nighter where you stayed up overnight with no sleep, uh, and then the next day you have to go do what you do, even if you have a job where you just use your brain to think and make decisions, if you go up even a flight of stairs the next day, you're so physically exhausted that there's a connection between neural fatigue up in the thinking part of the brain and further back in the part of the brain that has to do with the motor movements. We also know that this technology <coughs> has created a lot of neural fatigue, and we're measuring this now too, and I'll show you some stuff about that. Neural fatigue um, is important to understand because under the highest levels of physical stress, the brain actually shuts down the body. And uh, we know this now. We used to think the muscles just got too much lactic acid. They didn't have enough oxygen, and they, they stopped working. And secondary muscles took over, and it was less muscle mass. And that because of that, your speed slowed down, your muscle outputs for power slowed down, you couldn't jump as high, whatever. Now we know that the brain shuts down the body. That was figured out by a guy named Tim Noakes. He's a famous South, South African physiologist, and he proved it. So. so here's the motor part of the brain for all physical movement. See it? It's interesting. There it is. Uh, guess what sandwiches the motor movement part of the brain? The part of your brain for pain. So when you feel the pain, what do you do? You back off. You give up. You slow down. You say, oh, I can't do this. Right? And I can explain this if you have ever been an athlete. You could understand this or you young guys will understand this someday. Is that as you become a better and better athlete, as you do your sport more and more and more, you're going to realize that your pain threshold actually increases. You can stand more and more physical pain. And we've studied this all the way from young athletes with very low pain thresholds where you just go, I can't do this, right? And, and then by the time you're a senior, you're like, I can, do, I can do stuff you can't imagine. And maybe someday you can say, hey, I, 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 I'm a Navy SEAL. I can stand more pain than anybody, all right? So there's, there's a progression of the ability to function movement-wise when your brain is telling you to stop, all right? So that's interesting. Um, so we've also done studies with stress, like I told you, and social drugs and sleep. This is one of the first brain machines. Isn't that interesting? Um, this was the first attempt at an MRI machine, and of course it didn't work. It, the poor kid looked scared to death, and I don't blame him. Looks, looks more like a milking machine on his head. But um, anyway, this was the first attempt at magnetic magnetism that they were trying to actually look what's inside the brain and how it works. And... Um, you know, we've come a long way from there. We now have these, um, uh, this is called neural net. We have technology now where we can actually have very powerful sensors that actually can go subcranial through your skull to look at different areas of the brain. Um, and we've also done a lot with this human connectome project. And we got dibs on seeing this stuff before it was ever released for that National Geo article. But, you know, with these kind of things, they've now pinpointed where stuff happens in the brain with Look, attachment, romance, loneliness, anger, uh, pain. There's that pain thing I showed you that sandwiches the motor cortex. Uh, empathy, sympathy, fear, post-traumatic stress. You think we haven't used this with these soldiers? I mean, it's just amazing. You know, we're, we're trying to pinpoint, okay, where is this part of the brain that this, all this stuff's going down so we can deal with it? Um, and some scientists in Finland just recently made a suit that shows, it, it's actually called an EMG suit where we can actually see which parts of your body activate when you're feeling different emotions. Um, like look at anger. Um, here's anger up in the upper left-hand corner. Like when you get angry, don't you feel like your arms activate? Yeah, they do because that's your, you have to either defend yourself or be prepared for what's coming, right? I mean, you feel, 
you feel it go right down your arms, and that's just a normal, um, a normal reaction. But look at, look at love. Look at depression. Um, all these things. And so they took and they put this suit on these people with all these electrodes, just like the neural net. And they said, okay, like what parts of your body activate or uh, turn on when you feel these emotions? Um, I, I like the one for pride. You know, like when you're, when you're proud, you do something good, you feel like you're put, puffing your chest out and holding your head up high. I mean, you know, you, you guys that have ever, you know, maybe adults more than kids. I, I always say this. Everybody remembers the first time your picture was in the newspaper. Hopefully it wasn't in a mugshot. All right, so here's, so here's the deal. You feel, you feel proud. You're like, I'm my pic- that's my picture. I'm in the paper. I mean, I remember I was an athlete, really young, in Little League or something, and I was rounding first base or something, and you like, you'd cut it out and you put it on the fridge or whatever. You're proud of what you do. And that turns into other things, like self-respect and, and you know, maybe influences the way you're living your life. So this is pretty cool, cutting-edge technology from Finland that they, they made this stuff. Um, here's a young athlete practicing skills and an athlete after they've mastered a skill. Like I always say, you know, you've never ridden a bike until you've ridden a bike. You've crashed on a bike. You've crashed and burned on a bike. You've gotten all scuffed up. But then one day it comes that you integrate the, the pedaling and the steering and the balance. And, oh, my gosh, I'm riding a bike by myself. That's a nice day for parents, too. So um, we know skill development actually goes all the way, improves all the way up to age 21. And I, I have these athletes, you know, elite athletes, college basketball teams and stuff where they, I don't, I don't need to practice that anymore. I'm like, yeah, you do. You can still get better. So remember, that skills, like all you young athletes here think there's a lot of you. Practicing skills over and over and over. Yeah, it might get boring, but those are the athletes who will be real athletes someday. Um, and you keep practicing them up to age 21, just about the time brain development ends. Skill perfection, innovation, and skill efficiency Uh, all the way to age 21. This is a study that was done by UCLA. It's called the UCLA Brain Development Study. Um, The Brain Science Center out there actually looked at brain development. What we're looking for here is blue uh, as a representation of a brain reaching greater and greater levels of development. They know from this study that a brain develops all the way up to age 21, then it's pretty much wired and prepared for everything you're gonna do the rest of your life. Look at age five. This is up in the thinking part of your brain, but not much brain development. Age eight, not, not a great deal more, but look what kicks in horm- when your hormones start to kick in. The whole body starts to just rage with development. Look at age 12 to 16, how much blue comes into the picture. And this is for every single one of us. We never understood this when we were kids, but a lot of this is dependent upon the same things I'm talking to you about tonight, sleep. What if you got kids that are sleeping four, five, six hours a night now because of all their stuff? You think this is gonna just happen? Or happen later, maybe. Maybe that's another theory. So think how important it is, brain development-wise, from age 12 to 21. All these different things are really considered. This is the whole study. Sped up into a matter of seconds, this is a brain from birth to age 21, reaching greater and greater and greater levels of ability or function. I mean, that's just phenomenal stuff. So think about it. Age 12 to 21 is the second biggest growth phase in brain development. And then eventually our brain wears out. This is for you adults, right? As we get older, our brain actually, just like a battery runs out of charge, our battery starts to just not be rechargeable. And that happens as you age. Anyone who lives to an advanced age, 60, 70, 80, your brain actually starts to reduce the ability for it to regenerate. And it degenerates. There's no question about it. Um, This is a healthy uh, 15-year-old doing a simple memory task. This is a heavy alcohol using 15-year-old doing the same memory task. And their brains just have been damaged to the level they just don't produce any brain activity anymore. So these are just things we can show now that we never could show before. And you know what you had in the old days for this slide? That's probably not real good for you. You know, that's, uh, you know this is science. It's like if you want to convince somebody it's not good for kids to be using a lot of alcohol or marijuana or drugs that do this to your brain at this age, structurally and chemically and electrically, dampening it down, um, that's a pretty good study. Um, we also have looked at some amazing other things, and this is a good one for you adults too. Um, if you notice, this brain on top is wired sort of front to back, and this one's sort of all wired side to side up front, like this. You know what these two brains are? At, on, on December 2nd of this year, in front of the National Academy of Sciences, they actually figured out that women's and men's brains are wired differently, like we didn't know. All right, so... so uh, 
And I would even say that with my wife here. So here we go. Um, female brains are wired front to back longitudinally, and men's brains are wired very tightly up in this motor part of the brain. Geez, I wonder why that is. Because in those original developmental phases of the male brain, with our hormonal system, we're much more geared for gatherer, protector, you know, hunter, all that stuff, all the way from ancient times till now. Um, and, and that's just the way it is. Females' wiring is more geared for communication, analyzing, and intuition. Male brain geared more towards perception and coordinated physical action. All right, so that's different. We've taken this into consideration now when we have power training for training women athletes in power sports and men athletes in power sports. Totally different, as is even reaction times. So we're taking this all into consideration. So during this Human Connectome project, they actually came out with a video. I just want to show you uh, because it's so amazing to see. Uh, this, in your brain, you have 100 billion neurons or brain cells. And this is actually 7 million of your 100 billion brain cells. And since I don't see it on my desktop, which is not anything different than normal, um, we will use the capacity... Um, of typing in a keyword and finding it, except we have to spell vid right. Um, and um, hopefully it'll play. This is 7 million brain cells firing, and you have 100 billion, so you can imagine what that would look like. This is where we've come from the kid with a milking machine on his head to this. It's just incredible. And when I look at this, I think to myself, if there's anything that you should appreciate in your body, including athletes, it's probably your brain and central nervous system. All of our efforts in human performance have turned now to looking at the brain and central nervous system. Matter of fact, in Finland, 14th to 16th, I'm speaking at the World um, Strength and Power Coaches Clinic over there. And all I'm talking about is the, con the connection between the brain and the body for physical performance. It's, it's going to be a barn burner. Uh, people are going to fall off their chairs. Because, you know, we know all about the muscles, but, and, and we know all about the hormones and all these things, but now we're going to connect the most important factor, which is, which is the brain. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted you to see that, um, and I think that that's a, a pretty cool thing to, uh, to know that it, it, that, it, that it is that significant and important. Um, these are some of these pictures of the brain circuitry from Human Connectome. Just like... Inside electrical devices, there's wires. Well, we have pathways. And interestingly enough, um, they're also layered, just like circuitry is layered in electronics. You know, there's not, it's not all on one flat shelf. It's all different layers of, of uh, electric circuitry. Look at some of these pictures of these circuits. They said that the 100 billion nerve cells in your brain, if they spread it out, would take up four football fields. So I feel humbled by my 4-gig flash drive with everything I've done for 15 years on human performance project when I think of that what's in here would take up four football fields of surface area. Um, in that article that was in National Geo, and this is in a very recent version, see this giant snarl of circuitry right here? Well, you could pretty much guess that that's the area for a motor, your motor, co motor, motor cortex for movement, for physical movement. It takes a lot of wiring. And uh, matter of fact, of all the wiring in your motor cortex in the brain for being able to move physically, your body, one quarter of all that wiring is just for your hands, to be able to use your fingers and hands. And uh, you parents would appreciate this. Um, babies, you know, when they're young um, and they're sitting in their high chair, remember these days, all right, go back in time, um, and you throw a bunch of Cheerios or something on their tray, and half of them are very soon on the floor. Um, the babies can't do this. They can't use their pincher and, and um, their thumb to pick stuff up, so they, they try to pick it up with whatever way they can. But I mean, think of your motor cortex at a quarter of it's just for hand skills or fine motor skills. But he, this was in the article, and this is in my program for the superintendent here. When I talk to kids about learning, a piece of your brain tissue the size of a grain of salt has the memory capacity of 25,000 high-def DVDs. So you think about that, and then you think about not being able to remember 20 things for a test. All right, well, make your excuses, but I don't cut kids slack for excuses. I cut kids, uh, you know, slack for knowing stuff that their brain has easily the capacity to learn it, All right? So that's an interesting concept. Um, the total memory capacity of the brain, they estimated in this Human Genome G National Geo article, was they say 256 billion gigs. 
So there goes again my 4 gig flash drive. Throw it out, means very little. That's the same as about 1.2 billion PC hard drives or all the information that's in 15 major size uh, libraries like um, I always think of the Brooklyn Public Library, it's massive. Um, birth to age three, largest amount of brain development of your entire life. Second biggest phase, age 12 to 21. This is why people who do what these people in the front two rows do, try to help your kids not get hooked up with pot and alcohol and any other drugs. That's why we're so concerned about kids middle school through high school through college using those substances. Um, connections are made at a rapid pace during that time. Anything you practice or keep doing, you make connections. Anything you stop doing, you lose the connections. How about this? I'm sure we have golfers in here. In the winter, we probably don't golf as much, so it gets rusty, right? Or any other skill you could think of of something you do. Um, when you practice stuff, they stay connected. At the age of eight months, you have a trillion connections in your brain. There's no way to keep them connected. This is pre-birth even that you have that many connections. So because you can't possibly stimulate the brain to connect all those things and keep them connected, they start disconnecting. Um, here's the UCLA brain study slowed down age 4, age 12 or 13 when you go hormonal or reach puberty. And from 12 or 13 to 21, look at all that brain development. Those are connections being made in your brain. That's why I also talk to kids when I'm talking to uh, kids about learning. If you don't want to learn or you don't care to learn or you don't care to use your brain for positive things, you'll have connections for something, but it's probably not going to help you be successful in the future. Um, the developing brain age 12 to 21 incurs far greater levels of damage than any other time of your life. If you want to damage the brain, the worst time you could pick to damage it is age 12 to 21. While it's going through that last phase of mature brain development, age 12 to 21, and you damage it, the damage will be the worst of any time frame you could have picked to damage it. Um, this is a scan looking down on a brain. It's a healthy brain. Here's a damaged brain, okay? I mean, those are scans. Uh, they're not holes or is there decreased or lowered activity or structural damage in the brain. So remember that. We also can measure activity levels in the brain. Here's a brain with activity levels. This is brainstem activity back in the back of your brain. That's what keeps you breathing and, and alive. Here's somebody before um, using alcohol. Here's the same person after using alcohol. Okay, well, alcohol is a depressant drug. What, is el what does depressant mean? Shuts down brain activity, decreases brain activity, suppresses brain activity. So here's a brain normal function. Here's after they get intoxicated. It shuts down brain activity. If they drink too much or they drink alcohol with high concentrations of, li like for instance, liquor in a short amount of time, even these lights go out and then what happens? Then you have an alcohol poisoning death where you actually stop breathing, your heart stops beating, and you die. And we've had that happen too. So these are things that we try to use to show people that a depressant drug shuts down brain activity. Here's a different scan, but the same effect. Here's somebody before smoking marijuana. This is their brain activity levels. Here's the person after smoking marijuana. Depressant drugs shut down brain activity. Not just while you're stoned or drunk, but for even days and days afterward. So think about how this helps you. Yet so many people get caught up in it. So anyway, we also use this for these PTD, PTSD studies, post-traumatic stress. Anyone who's ever had a, a horribly um, uh, stressful event or an emotional event, you can end up with PTSD and, or some form of it. Uh, even somebody who's ever been bit by a dog, maybe even at a young age, some dog bites you. The rest of your life, you know, you sort of have this paranoia about hearing toenails on pavement. You know, I mean, you just, it freaks you out. And it's always in the back of your mind. But um, these guys that have been coming back from, from uh, the stuff they've had to deal with over in Afghanistan and Iraq and other places, um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the, uh, the effect it has. Uh, so we can measure these effects on the brain as far as here's somebody in a calm state. You can see up in the thinking part of the brain up front behind your forehead, not much happening. Same person when they're in a stressful st situation. You know, and I told you what stress does for you. Compromises being at your best for sure. Just like athletes who get nervous before a competition, well, everybody does. Uh, a guy's in, a, in an Olympic final tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock that has to step on a line after training for four years or eight years, or I had one athlete I coached for 16 years. You think they're not nervous? A Navy SEAL, they, they, they get ready to go out on an op. You think they're not nervous? They have to know how to handle that nervousness so that it doesn't degrade their performance. 
Um, that's some of those things from sports psychology. So power back diets here. Um, I, I think somebody's selling them, but it's, that's fine with me. Um, maybe it can help some of the other functions of your programming. Here's the sleep, the sleep and recovery document too. Um, food choices determine energy levels. I mean, you know, we've got uh, you know 160,000 fast food restaurants in our country, and 50 million people go there every day. And uh, that's 30, that's 35 percent of our population that's uh, that's got problems with their weight. Um, American diet: um, 16 teaspoons of sugar, to a half a cup of fat, and two teaspoons of salt. If you eat a totally unrestricted diet, I'll eat anything. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care about eating healthy or choosing proper foods or, uh, you know, you know, eating normal or, or, or you know, going out to eat or so forth. Uh, it's been updated now to 22 teaspoons. It's now up to 23. So it's not getting better. It's in everything. Um, our brain uses a form of sugar, but it's a kind called glucose. All right. If you want to have your brain function on the only substrate it can function with, it's glucose. It can transform other forms of sugar into glucose, but it runs best on glucose. Look, this is glucose. It's what's in Gatorade or Powerade. Full strength. Sip it. Watch your brain function at a high level. Use fructose. Not as good. That's from fruit sugar. Use sucrose or corn sweetener or candy bars or Coca-Cola. Not as good. Your brain won't function on it. The only substrate your brain runs on is glucose. Want to hear an ironic one? The only substrate your muscles run on is glucose. What would be the best substance to use if you want your brain and muscles to run at their optimal level? Probably glucose. Think about that one. Glucose makes you shine. Cognitive function, thinking, taking a test, studying, anything. Or performing as an athlete physically. So since your brain and muscles run on those things, you might want to consider what you drink. The optimal concentration half glucose sport drink powerade or gatorade mixed half and half with water for most people gatorade or powerade are hypertonic they're too sweet water them half and half with water it's optimal solution united states ranks number one in the world not in olympic gold medals anymore in soda consumption uh, to the tune of 54 gallons per year so figure a 55 gallon drum and then take every man woman and child in this country all of them, babies included, all U.S. citizens together average 54 gallons per year of soda consumption. And then think about the problems we have with our American diet. Uh, soda depletes your body of vitamins and minerals. There's no question about it. Tons of scientific studies on it. You want to be an athlete, you shouldn't even drink any soda, zero. Uh, and that's a fact. Not even once in a while. It's not for any athlete. Um, there's the amount of sugar content in a can of Coke, a 20-ounce uh, Coke, or a torpedo of Coke. Um, your systems in your body have no way to deal with that amount of sugar, believe me. Um, you get a sugar high, you release insulin, it pulls all the sugar out of your system and deposes it and stores it as fat. That's what will happen. As young guys, right now that's not going to happen. But keep drinking it and that's what's going to happen. And you'll start to put that weight first around your waist and uh, your butt in those areas in, in your torso. Um, diet soda is even worse than regular. There's no question about it. I've look, myself done a ton of looking at this aspartame, which is actually classified as an excitotoxin. Excito, ex it excites the brain and central nervous system and toxin, poison. Right? It actually works just the opposite way. It, it increases your sugar craving. It actually confuses your body to even recognize what a sugar is and over time decreases your body's ability to handle what a real sugar is. And that's the problem, is that sugar's in everything. So even if you try to keep sugar out of your system, it's going to be in your system. It's in everything in our diet. And the best example is to go to Europe or somewhere where they don't have all that sugar in their diet and stay there for about a week and watch how no energy that you have because you have so low blood sugar all the time. Then you'll realize how jacked our diet is with, with sugar. Um, your brain run has a chemical component to it. I, I said earlier today, your brain just is like a battery. You charge it up. What's inside a battery? Battery acid and, and water and fluids, right? And if we look what's in your brain, the liquid part of your brain is these neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine mostly. If you run down your neurotransmitters, your brain doesn't function at a very high level. And um, some of the studies that have been done on this, just to show you, 
anything, chemicals, substances, foods, minerals, they accelerate the use of neurotransmitters. You uptake those neurotransmitters and you use them up. So here's an interesting one that I could show you. Even sugar makes you use up your neurotransmitters quicker. Here's a fully loaded neurotransmitter brain. Here's a depleted neurotransmitter brain. If we deplete the neurotransmitters out of your brain, mental and physical function degrade and start to go down. Um, so many kids nowadays drinking these energy drinks. Even little kids, kids in middle school already starting to use these. Why are they using them? No different than kids who have stress who smoke dope and drink. Why? They self-medicate. They're tired. They're fatigued. They don't sleep enough. They overstim their brains all the time. Their brains are tired. They have neural fatigue. So they use energy drinks. If you have neural fatigue and you use caffeine, for instance, which are in concentrations in these kind of drinks way more than the originals, coffee and tea, you use up your neurotransmitters 500 times more than normal. Once you use them up, what do you have to use for mental and physical function? You don't, you're just neurotransmitter depleted like the slide I showed you before. You get energy spikes as a result of using a stimulant when your brain is tired, and then you sink into deeper and deeper deficits. A lot of it's related to neurotransmitters which are depleted. If you use nicotine, so many older athletes chewing. Certain sports, notorious for it. Lacrosse, football, wrestling, baseball, always has been, right? Right, guys with chew. Every time you put that stuff in your mouth, you're using up your neurotransmitters 700 times more than normal. <laughs> I, at least one person in this, in this room has been around Major League Baseball. <laughs> How many guys chew? Oh, probably majority. And they're trying to deal with it. But think of using up all your neurotransmitters and then trying to use your brain at a high functional level. Your neurotransmitter depleted all the time. Where would you be if you had those neurotransmitters to use for physical function? Depressant substances, you would think, wouldn't have the same effect. But in fact, alcohol makes you use up your neurotransmitters 225 times more than normal. Think of that. And marijuana, the least of any drug, 100 times more than normal. You know what the most was of all substances they tested in this study? Methamphetamine makes you use up your neurotransmitters 1,000 times more than normal. And once you use them up, your brain is just trashed. So think about that. So it doesn't matter if we're using a depressant drug or a stimulant. The effect is the same. You use up those chemical substances your brain needs to have to run at optimum levels. Once you deplete serotonin, you have decreased brain and body function. Once you deplete dopamine, you have decreased motivation. There, that explains the amotivational syndrome, right, that we used to have a lot more of where I don't care anymore. I just don't care. Things I used to care about that I just don't care about anymore. It's lost its significance. The ratio between serotonin and dopamine determines your mood regulation. Oh my gosh. Are we starting to connect some dots here? People who get into substance abuse, are they mood stable? No, their, their emotions run the whole gamut. What happens when somebody who, who's addicted to nicotine can't have chew or, or a smoke? Are they like, oh, I, I think I'll get down to the... The Circle K and get some more nicotine. No, they, you get frantic because you don't have the ability to control your moods. Same thing with people addicted to drugs. This, this explains it all. So here's the parts of your brain we use when we're up 16 hours a day. Thinking part, pre-movement and movement. Pre-movement and movement. That's how we do movements. Coach Underwood wants to pick up the laser pointer. I'm thinking about it. I'm using the blue zone. I'm using the blue zone. I'm thinking about picking up the the laser pointer, and then I actually have already stacked a sequence of movements I'm going to make to go do it in the green zone, pre-movement, and then when I actually go to do it, I use the red zone. There it is. I just did it. That's what you use all day in school to walk to classes, to do, to function, to do your job, all this stuff. And when we're at practice, same thing. We have a thinking part to being an athlete, and then we use the movement part. So there it is. We have too much information overload. I'm really trying to overload you tonight, so here we go. We have to process information. Uh, half the human population is now under the age of 30. It's unprecedented. If we fatigue the thinking part of the brain, does it affect other parts of the brain? Yeah. It works its way back to pre-movement and movement. My analogy, you pull an all-nighter the next day, you, you get tired going up a flight of stairs. Why? You're neurally fatigued. It affects physical performance. The amount of information we're now exposed to in the last 50 years now uh, is, is more than the previous 5,000 years. We have information overload. How many times a day do you look at your phone? Come on. 
Do you ever leave your phone home for a day and just or lose it, and you're like, oh, what am I going to do? And you, you freak out and panic, and then after about you know, half a day, you start going like, this is awesome. You know, I, I, I have so much more time for important stuff, right? Every piece of information that you're exposed to, your brain has to process. Do I want to remember this? Nah, it's, it's, I don't need to remember this and so forth. I'm going to tell you a story. My wife is from Russia. Um, she had friends, and they had a baby that was a year and a half old. And um, they let the baby play with an iPad. And um, so one day their baby was in the kitchen, and it was winter, and she was looking out in the backyard. And um, there was a sliding glass door, and she saw a squirrel, and she put her hand on the glass of the window, and she was trying to enlarge the view of the squirrel. And the baby was, the baby was, was a year and a half old. So that's where technology gets a little George Orwellic for me. But anyway, sleep. The importance of sleep on mental performance or physical performance um, I've published now, it's, if you look tonight, you'll see that it, actually the pictures aren't purchased yet. It says Shutterstock on the cover photo. That doesn't scare me. They can, they can sue me. I, I, I'm, I gave them credit for the picture. Anyway, um, they're being, it's being published by the Life of an Athlete Project for the whole state of New Hampshire. All high schools have to go through this program because they have said we got too many student athletes that are nowhere near their potential. So anyway, you can get a copy of this, and it's got some great stuff in it. Like, for instance, the temperature of your room. Optimal sleep is at 67 to 72 degrees. Hotter than that, you won't sleep as well. Colder than that, you won't sleep as well, unless you live in a climate that's like that. Um, sleep in total darkness. Any light in a room will prevent you from getting optimal sleep. Just like if you try to go to sleep in a room where the lights are totally on, it's, it's, you're going to have broken sleep. Um, if you normally get eight hours of sleep and all of a sudden you get just one and a half hours less than your normal sleep, your brain alertness levels drop by 30%. I'll be seeing it tomorrow morning because I'll be in a school tomorrow doing my first talk at a public school at 720. I can't wait to see that one. I don't know what time they get up for school, five? I mean, or, uh, who knows? Anyway, um, we did a study and found that the average middle school and high school athletes are now sleeping six hours and 40 minutes a night. That's the median range. Lots are sleeping four to six hours. Here was the study. 27% of them are sleeping less than six hours. Only 17% are sleeping eight hours or more. That's a problem. That's a problem for anybody, for school, for cognitive function, thinking function. That's a problem for athletes, and I know and can show you why. While you're asleep, you have muscle restorative phase, organ restorative phase, like heart, lungs, liver, all that stuff and central nervous system restorative phase. I already told you. This goes down one and a half to two hours after you fall asleep. This goes down between two o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning. And that's if you go to bed at 10 o'clock. The Stanford Sleep Studies by Sherry Ma. Every single person on every single team that was in the study, when they slept more than their normal sleep, their performance and stats went up. When they slept their normal sleep, their performance and stats went down. After the study, she said that sleep is an absolute predictor of performance in any sport, not just skill-based sports. One of those teams was their women's basketball team. They played for the national championships that year. They lost to UConn in the finals. That was UConn's first 40-0 season, undefeated, never lost a game. And people's stats in the sport of basketball, everything, three-point percent, rebounds, turnovers, everything went up and down based on sleep. Ten hours a night or four to six hours a night during their competitive season. So think about that. Um, here's a side note. Their swim team that year uh, set 28 personal records, some were school records, some were NCAA records. One was an American record. Every single one of those records was set in a phase where they were sleeping 10 hours a night. None were set in a phase where they were sleeping their normal sleep. So if you think sleep isn't important as an athlete, man, are you missing it. And I can also say this to you guys. Remember, it's not the night before. It's it's one to three days out that you gain that effect. Um, reaction time, I took, um, I had actually 24 hockey players in the Olympic Training Center, had them stay up overnight the last night of a training camp. They'd been in a training camp for 10 days. Their reaction time actually was a team average of 186 thousandths of a second. They stayed up overnight the last night of the training camp. The next day, the reaction time was 240. It went down 25% just based on pulling an all-nighter. Uh, the kind of sleep you have to get is called REM. It's when your brain gets to reboot and get its energy back, just like the, uh, the, phone, the cell phone uh, with the, the four bars. Uh, REM is very unique. You fall asleep and you start getting REM sleep, and it accumulates a, a total of one and a half to two and a half hours in, 
in eight hours of sleep. That's what you need to get for your brain to get its energy levels back and do a whole bunch of important things. You, re you actually uh, download information from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. That would be important for school, for learning. Um, you also gain all the ability for movement memory to fill in in the movement part of the brain for athletes, and, uh, and that's important for learning skills and maintaining them. This is a person that, didn't, that slept eight hours, and this is a person that didn't sleep at all, uh, an all-nighter. So if this is their forehead, back of a head, forehead, back of a head, this is somebody, blood flow in the brain of somebody who got eight hours of sleep, blood flow all the way around. Here's somebody that got no sleep. Minimum blood flow up in the thinking part of the brain, midbrain, those areas for uh, pre-movement and movement, and on the sides of your brain, balance, uh, no blood flow at all. So if you think about the next day after pulling an all-nighter, you actually feel like your balance is a little whacked out. You have no blood flow in the sides of your brain where your balance center is. Um, 90 to 20 minutes, 120 minutes after you fall asleep is when you get that huge HGH release. If you want to go to sleep a different time every night, it's not going to like move around for you. You just lose all that ability for muscle to be formed and function. You, you grow in, at night when you release that HGH. That's when uh, it's the most important for you to, to um, get the sleep. Here's the proof of that study. Here's an athlete going to bed at 10 o'clock at night and getting up 6 in the morning. Look at the HGH release all night long, his normal bedtime. Two nights later, he goes to bed at midnight and gets up at 8. So both nights he sleeps 8 hours, but because he missed that 90 to 120 minute window, he gets just a little bit of HGH. There goes all that ability for muscle to gain all those effects. Technology is a huge problem. We now know that kids' TV time has only gone up about 5%, but internet time has gone up 121% in the last five years to the tune of about 13 hours a week for each, uh, to the tune of 26 hours a week total. I don't know how you can be successful at much with using your time for that. If you look at blue light, especially in total darkness, from backlit devices like laptops and phones and TVs, uh, it actually prevents the brain from shutting down. And, um, and actually releasing the hormone to make you get sleepy. That doesn't even include texting time and phone time and all that important stuff. So here's a poster for all the kids and even for some adults. And um, people laugh, but I mean, you know, how funny is it? Um, last but not least, this is uh, an x-ray of a broken leg. And just like I said, we now have the technology to see if brains are broken. Here's these scans for... Um, uh, damage in brains. Here's some of the damage. Um, you can see they're not holes, areas of decreased or lowered activity. Here's four normal, healthy scans of a 17 year old brain. Okay? Here's somebody who's had a severe brain injury, uh, somebody that maybe didn't wear a seatbelt, took blunt trauma to the thinking part of the brain. This would be somebody who's a vegetable now. Here's uh, somebody who's had a stroke. You can see the damage, terrible damage, about a third of the brain. Here's Alzheimer's, really bad case of Alzheimer's. Um, Here's uh, some of these NFL and NHL scans on concussions, multiple concussions. Look at the damage in the brain from, from having who knows how many concussions, and uh, it's just brutal. Uh, here's heroin. Uh, here's cocaine. Here's methamphetamine, uh, basically rotten spots in your brain. Um, here's a healthy 17-year-old brain. Here's a heavy alcohol using 17-year-old brain. Um, anybody who thinks alcohol doesn't hurt you or, you know, hey, I only do it once a week or it's not a big deal, it's a big deal, uh, especially when you're doing it at that age of 12 to 21. Um, this is a daily pot smoker, 16 years old. Uh, all drugs leave damage in the brain. I, I have these scans even for caffeine, nicotine, any drugs. Um, so here's healthy 19-year-old, heavy alcohol abusing 19-year-old. Top and bottom healthy 19, heavy alcohol abuse, abusing 19, one year after they stopped using alcohol. What do you see? Regeneration. The, the word now for it is plasticity. The ability for the brain to repair damage at a really incredible rapid rate while the brain is still developing. So that's uh, at least one thing you can fall back on, but I think it's a better scenario not to damage your brain. I did a scientific study and proved that in, in, in 2004 and 5 that every time you get drunk, you lose as much as 14 days of training effect in human muscle. It was a muscle enzyme study. That's what put us on the map on this topic. Think of training good for two weeks and going out and getting drunk, and then you just wasted all that progress that you spent developing for 14 days. Um, this is actually a billboard in Portland, Oregon. 
to that effect. This is in New Mexico where they have our program in all high schools statewide. This is in Eastern Oregon in the middle of nowhere, La Grande, Oregon. And this is this was actually in, right next to Syracuse University in my state, upstate New York, in, uh, um, uh, in, 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 in um, New York State Public High School Athletic Association put that up. Uh, last but not least, the substance that people think is harmless, your state's already gone medical and now you're trying to decriminalize it and we'll see where that one goes. Doesn't add anything to anybody's life. Um, it's, it's not the answer, it's just a, a cop out uh, by people who can't handle or find ways to deal with, um, with, with the problems that they have in their lives. I already showed you how it shuts down brain activity. I spent a year looking at research, most of it from Europe. Is it addictive? 80% of kids in rehab today are there for marijuana. So is it addictive? I kind of think so. Otherwise, why are 8 out of 10 kids in rehab there for marijuana? I visited one of those wilderness retreat centers in Montana last year, uh, Thompson Falls, Montana. Uh, it costs about 60000 bucks to send your kid there to get them off drugs. 8 out of 10 kids that I interviewed were there for marijuana. Um, it goes to your brain, hooks up in receptor sites. There's where it goes. Anybody who smokes it, that's where it is in your brain tissue. It's, it's pretty much universal. Um, it also goes to your kidney, uh, your kidneys, your liver, takes a huge amount of receptor sites from, for THC, and your bladder, of course, as it cuts loose from your system. Whole body scan. So it doesn't just go to your brain. We, are, we always knew that. It goes to different parts of your, your body that uh, are really not good places to put uh, a lot of that kind of substance. Um, this is actually a picture of THC in brain tissue of a daily pot smoker. The green is all THC in receptor sites in brain tissue. Pretty phenomenal picture. So anyone who smokes it, if you smoked it once, you'd have a couple specks of green. This is a daily pot smoker's brain. So as it builds up to higher and higher levels, it starts to affect brain function. Um, the part that we looked at that was in the middle of the brain, right next to pre-movement and movement, we thought that might not be a good place. So in an MRI, this is a non-pot smoker tapping their finger. When you're an MRI, you're in the dome there, you're just laying on your back, you can't move around. This is a person at their side tapping their finger, a non-pot smoker. Tapping your finger, non-pot smoker, pot smoker, not stoned under the influence of marijuana. There's where the signal still starts from. Look, one, two, three, four, five other parts of the brain have to reroute the signal before you can tap your finger. That's because there's so much of it in that central part of the brain, in the pre-movement movement part of the brain, that now your brain has to reroute the whole circuitry to be able to pull off tapping your finger. Um, a lot of it in the cerebellum, the part of your brain responsible for muscle coordination, equilibrium, balance, muscle tone, and the ability to perform rapid alternating movements. Reaction time of an elite athlete, 186 thousandths of a second. Once a, once a week pot smoker is about 300 milliseconds. Three to four times a week, only about 312, not much of a difference. Daily pot smokers heading towards half a second to be able to, tap, to uh, react uh, and that is the result of being, not being able to transmit the signal and make it happen. You have to reroute the signal. Slows down your ability to send a signal. This is a 32-year-old bottom scan of a lifelong pot smoker, only drug of choice, marijuana. It is not a harmless drug. It is a damaging drug. The worst damage that can be done is between the ages of 12 and 21. We know it. That's science. That's irrefutable. It doesn't help people. It hurts people, especially young developing brains. If you change the way you live your life, you can change lots of things. Certainly the way you compete, academically, athletically, in any way, shape, or form. Job market, maybe even. Um, someday your life will flash before your eyes. Hopefully you'll be an old person laying on your deathbed. All right, That's sort of a, something that we prepare for over time. Um, this is a slide I made for Naval Special Warfare. I said, one day your life will flash before your eyes. Do something worth watching. Every day your life matters and every day your life counts. And the only way that really counts is when you make it matter and you make it count. And I think that's a message for our young people, certainly for athletes. If you want to be successful, think about the way you're doing it. And even adults, when's the last time you took some quiet time to just think about the way you're living your life? There's things we can do better. You can be more productive. You can give more time to things that matter and count, people who matter and count. Think about that. And um, I want you guys to think about considering bringing Life of an Athlete program or athlete committed program to your school. Start with your athletes and give them better information to make better choices. Teach them how this all affects not just your athletic career or your academic standing or your GPA, 
how it's going to affect the rest of your life. Kids are making decisions now in middle school and high school that are already affecting the way their life's going to turn out. This can be something that really has some value. Um, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. I'm going to stick around. I'm going to stick around for a, for a while. I also have some business cards. If anybody wants one, I can, um, I can give you those, and you can take one. Look at our website. We've got a lot of great stuff on there. And I'll leave these cards down here too. If you want some, grab one. Oh, a survey. Survey. Here's your flash drive. <laughs> Oh, that was mind-boggling, wasn't it? <laughs> Do you have neural fatigue now, everybody? All right, then go home and go to sleep. <laughs>